Uh, thank you, Brian, for that uh, excellent introduction. It's really an honor to be here, a uh, pleasure. Uh, Dr. McCall alluded to my father picking me up in the, uh, the early morning hours to drive an hour to, to Ridgefield to, uh, to Holy Mass. I'd like to dedicate this, uh, this conference, though, to my mom. Uh, she just passed away. Uh, she died on Holy Thursday. Uh, she's the mother of, of a priest, also the grandmother of a priest. Uh, so it was a very fitting and providential day for a very good Catholic woman to, uh, to die. Uh, just a beautiful example, 62 years of fidelity uh, as a Catholic wife, uh, five children, obviously one as a, as a priest. Uh, I can say that uh, without her prayers and without her example, uh, and the instilling of the you know, the living of the Catholic faith uh, before our eyes as we grew up, um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be a priest, certainly wouldn't be here giving this conference today. So I'd like to dedicate the, the conference to Alice McMahon and ask for your, uh, your prayers for the, the repose, the eternal repose of her soul. As the doctor alluded, uh, we both attended um, Yale University together, so we were at the same uh, the same school at the same time. He also, I believe he was in England in 1999. So I was there from 98 to 2000. So we, we were there together as well. Uh, and ironically, however, we didn't know each other, as he mentioned, in, uh, in school. But ironically, at a school which neither one of us attended, we became close friends. And that was at La Salette Academy uh, because uh, Dr. McCall uh, enrolled his, his boys. Uh, three of them there are currently are currently there, and uh, one is now in his fourth year at the seminary who graduated from La Salette in 2015. Now, speaking of the academy, I, I was there for the, the past 13 years until September, and the previous five I was also teaching. So for the last 18 years, I've had the, the great privilege and joy of teaching high school boys, uh, particularly in religion class, the junior and the senior classes. It's just been a wonderful experience imparting to them like my good parents gave to me and many good priests, a, a knowledge and a love of the Catholic faith. In order to do that, though, we have to teach in these times. We have to equip our young people with the ability to think and to see things as they are, to perceive reality, to recognize reality, and then to be able to live in this world. So one of the exercises over, over the course of those years, we actually have one of our, one of our graduates is here, 2014, Sam Schrader. And one of the exercise, academic exercises, is to get them to think about something and then to be able to summarize, get to the, really the, the, the core of it, I would say, and I'm sure this is an infamous, not a, it's a famous and infamous exercise, was I would say, tell me in one word, what in one word summarize that? And that's what I'm going to do today. In one word, to summarize this conference, the conference, a new priest for a new mass, this one word when properly understood, this one word when properly applied, will allow us to understand in, 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 in a pithy manner this entire conference that word is sacrifice. So the nature of sacrifice, the virtue of sacrifice, the spirit of sacrifice, the sacrifice of the cross, the sacrifice of the mass, all of this will allow us to understand when we get to that point, a new priest and a new mass. The entire life of our Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore the continuation of that incarnation in his life, there was Holy Church, the mystical body, is going to be about sacrifice. Sacrum facere, to make sacred, to make holy, to consecrate. Our Lord said he came to make all things new. In other words, to make all things sacred, to elevate everything, to baptize in a certain sense everything. In the, the beginning of the conference, I'd simply like to uh, provide then a context. The, the doctor did a wonderful job in providing that general framework uh, in, his, in, his, in his very Thomistic way of getting everything framed perfectly for us now to follow, but a certain context by reviewing 
and for most of you, or for all of you, it should be a review, and then to provide a connection in this review. If we look at sacrifice just in the wide sense, the wide sense of this term in the definition would be every inner act of self-surrender to God and every external manifestation of the inner sacrificial disposition. In essence, this is our morning offering. We offer to Almighty God this day all its joys, its works, its sufferings, etc. through the day. Everything can be made sacred. Everything can be sacrificed. This is going to be our prayers, our mortifications, almsgiving, the virtuous actions that we do throughout the day, even the smallest of things in the state of grace for the proper intention can be sacrificed. However, I'm getting closer to the point, in a more narrow liturgical sense, and the doctor put a, a definition of sacrifice up there, in this sense, the external religious act in which a gift which is perceptible to the senses is offered by an ordained servant of God in recognition of the absolute sovereignty and majesty of God. And given the fall, given original sin, that is to be offered, that external act, that external offering by the ordained minister in atonement for sins. This, in the history of the world, up to and including the Catholic faith, is the very peak or summit of adoration, the sacrificial act. This will be the, the natural law demands adoration, and the summit of that adoration throughout human history will be sacrifice in this more narrow liturgical sense, time immemorial. We go all the way back to Cain and Abel. We look throughout the entire world, in the history of the world, before Christ, the ancient Egyptians, the Babylonians, the, the Phoenicians, the Greeks, the Romans, in the East, the Chinese. Throughout the entire world, in the history of the world, we're going to see this type of liturgical sacrifice. We especially will see it then, since it's the peak of adoration of Almighty God, we're going to see it in the revealed religion. In the Old Testament, then the chosen people multitude of unbloody sacrifices, numerous bloody sacrifices, the hands put over the sacrificial animal, the throat cut, the blood let, the, the body then burned either totally in a holocaust or partly, and then the remains being consumed by the offering priests. You can see all of this in recognition of the majesty and sovereignty of Almighty God, and it's, it, 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 it is the, the, an integral part of worship. There will be notable exceptions. One will be pure Buddhism, which we don't really care about right now. The other exception, which doesn't recognize sacrifice as an integral part of worship, liturgical worship, is Protestantism. The Protestants don't. Therefore, this need for sacrifice is inherent in men. It's the, the part of the natural law, the very peak of the virtue, the natural virtue of religion. All of this historical sacrifice is going to culminate, reach its culmination in what? In the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. This, these sacrifices will find their full expression and their perfection in Good Friday, on Calvary, making all things new. The one perfect sacrifice supplanting the many, the shadow giving way to the reality. Classic definition, the sacrifice of the new law is the Son of God himself, who by his death on the cross offered himself to his heavenly Father, on our behalf, and as St. Paul then says, obtaining an everlasting redemption. This is the sacrifice of the new law. You can say certainly the old law foreshadowing, but even all of those sacrifices, the need of man to sacrifice, make sacrifice to God in this liturgical sense. The sacrifice of our Lord, of course, is the most perfect sacrifice. It is a divine person who is both priest and victim. He is also incarnate 
and uses his human nature, body and soul, as instruments, this human instrumentality to make reparation for sin committed by man. Therefore, we can say a true man sacrificing for all men. This sacrifice of our Lord on the cross, it's the expression of the most perfect and absolute submission to God's will. We've reached the summit and perfection of sacrifice. The incarnate word, the son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, assuming a human nature and offering himself in adoration to the Father for the salvation of men due to the sins of men. De fide, the God-man Jesus Christ is a high priest. De fide, Christ offered himself on the cross as a true and a proper, proper sacrifice. We're establishing this context. So we have sacrifice, its essential necessity in the very nature of man. Man is and therefore owes this to God. All of these sacrifices will find themselves spread throughout the world, throughout history. They culminate in the cross, the perfect sacrifice. But the foreshadowing of that perfect sacrifice speaks about a, per a perpetual sacrifice. So this sacrifice must continue. And the continuation of this cross, which was not the, of this of this sacrifice, excuse me, was not to end on Good Friday, but it was to continue. This perpetual sacrifice, which is foretold and prefigured in the Old Testament, Almighty God specifically speaks about it. Now there are numerous places, but we're probably most familiar about the maybe the most important and explicit one from the prophet Malachi. From the rising of the sun until the setting thereof, my name is great amongst the Gentiles, and in every place there is sacrifice, and there is offered in my name a clean oblation, in reference not just to the cross to come, but the perpetuation of that cross, which is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. The new law being a fulfillment of the old law, necessarily there's going to be the continuation of the summit and perfection, the perfect expression of sacrifice. Sacrifice must continue in the perfect religion, the fulfillment of all that came before. De fide, holy mass is a true and proper sacrifice. The sacrifice of the mass is the perpetual renewal and the continuation of the cross. And it's the application of the merits and graces won by our Lord on the cross on Good Friday. This is the work of the redemption. This is the sacrifice of the new law, one. We must be very clear about that. The cross and the mass are one. We can say it's the acquisition of the graces and the application of the graces. The objective redemption when all graces are won in a bloody manner on one day at one moment in human history, and then the continual application of those graces until the last man, to the last day of human history. This is the redemption, this is the sacrifice of the mass, this is the perpetuation of the sacrifice of the cross. Now, St. Paul, will speak about Christ ever, and this is, this is now a continuation and a greater emphasis upon this perpetual sacrifice. Christ ever liveth to make intercession for us. He, he writes that to the Hebrews in his epistle to the Hebrews. We know that our Lord Jesus Christ now reigns on the right hand of God the Father. His intercession for us is not meant to cease, it is meant to continue. The basis of this continuation, of this intercession, I should say, it's the cross, it's Calvary. This is what he is offering in heaven now, the perpetual sacrifice. Our Lord is perpetually and eternally offering his own death to the Father on our behalf. The great Frank Sheet has a beautiful quote, Mass, then, is truly heaven, so to speak, as it were, breaking through to the earth so that it can be seen by men. It's a participation in the perpetual liturgy which is happening in eternity. And if we're saved, 
if we leave, live a holy life and die a holy death, we'll participate in that, in that liturgy forever and ever. De fide. In the sacrifice of the Mass, Christ's sacrifice on the cross is made present, its memory is celebrated, and its saving power is applied. De fide. In the sacrifice of the Mass, and in the sacrifice of the cross, the sacrificial gift and the primary sacrif sacrificing priest are identical. Only the nature and the mode of the offering are different. So there we have now, before we get to the priesthood, in the last part of this initial part, which establishes our context within which we'll be able to look at this new thing, this new mass, and this new priesthood, we're brought then to the priesthood itself. Sacrifice. Sacrifice of our Lord on the cross. The perpetuation of that sacrifice in the sacrifice of the mass and the necessity of an ordained servant of God to perpetuate that sacrifice by the will of Almighty God. By our faith, then, of course, as I just said, we know the sacrificing priest is our Lord Jesus Christ, who utilizes the human priest by virtue of the sacrament, the sacramental character of holy orders. So the priest offering the mass is our Lord Jesus Christ. One cross, one mass, one sacrifice of the new law, essentially the same priest. He's going to utilize this human agent. He's going to utilize through the sacramental character on the soul, imprinted upon the soul of this man in order to use him as his servant and as his representative to fulfill the sacrificial action. He chooses a human agent through which he is going to perform this sacrifice. The consecration will be performed through this man in virtue of the sacramental character on his soul. It's very important to rely upon the, the church's infallible teaching. So we go to the Council of Trent, the Great Council of Trent. Session 7 dealt with the Catholic priesthood. And the very first chapter establishes this, quote, Sacrifice and priesthood are, by the ordinance of God, in such ways connected, conjoined, as they have existed, both existed in every order of salvation. Whereas, therefore, in the New Testament, the Catholic Church has received by the institution of Christ the holy and visible sacrifice of the Eucharist, it must also needs be confessed that there is in that church a new, visible, and external priesthood into which the old has been translated. Trent establishing that intimate connection between the sacrifice of the mass and the sacrificer, if we can say that, the priest, the ordained minister, both by the ordinance of God both by the institution of our Lord Jesus Christ, and essentially that's happening on Holy Thursday. Mediator Dei, Pope Pius XII, a little more recent, 1947, this encyclical on the sacred liturgy, and this is a very important point. Pope Pius XII says, the unbloody immolation by which, after the words of consecration have been pronounced, Christ is rendered present on the altar, in the state of a victim, is performed by the priest alone. And by the priest, so the qualification, priest alone, and by the priest insofar as he acts in the name of Christ, not insofar as he represents the faithful. Very important the church's magisterium, as we should know and will certainly see. So the sacrificial rite, it forms and it informs the Catholic priest. The priesthood is then defined by sacrifice, by the sacrifice of the cross, by the sacrifice of the mass, by the virtue of sacrifice, by the spirit of sacrifice, living that spirit. When you look at a properly formed and then a priest who conforms himself properly to that formation, we see what? We see a celibate clergy. 
the sacrifice of the potential to be married and have a family. We have the divine office, this burden, the officium divinum, the muse, the, the, divine, the divine burden being taken on, where the priest now has to pray for the whole church, pray under the pain of mortal sin, and pray that, that prayer daily. You have the cassock, the black cassock, that external manifestation of a death, of a perpetual sacrifice, of someone who has given himself to conforming in a more perfect way by the will of God to the great eternal high priest, our Lord Jesus Christ. The mortification, the whole life, all of that goes into just speaking, both at the very center and all the way to the periphery that the priest is meant for sacrifice. St. Paul to the Hebrews again, for every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifice. And that Trent, it's very important to keep that in mind. Sacrifice and the priesthood have ever been so conjoined, so connected, that by the ordinance of God, they've existed in all ages. All right, we have the, the context here. Sacrifice, cross, mass, priesthood. Now it's time to begin looking more carefully at what has transpired. What has transpired to bring about a new mass and this new priesthood necessarily? I'll start with a quote of the great Archbishop Lefebvre. Early quote, when, uh, not early quote for him, obviously his great church life existed well before the society, but the, in, his, in 1974, so very soon after the whole implementation of the new mass, December 2nd, 1974, if we change the liturgy profoundly, then we change the priesthood. Because the priesthood is entirely oriented to the liturgy. This is the very defini definition of the priesthood. The priest is made for sacrifice. If we start to denature the sacrifice, we denature the priest. And I would go even further and say, if we start to destroy the notion of the sacrifice of the mass, there will no longer be a Catholic church. 1974. So, hand in hand, and we saw some of those obviously in the doctor's presentation, hand in hand with these liturgical innovations, which are going to gut the notion of sacrifice, and therefore directly affect that intimately connected priesthood, we also have in this bubble around it a new theology of the priesthood, of the mass, which has a very strong ecumenical bent, as we know, which is introduced, and that is going to distort and confuse the roles of the priests and the faithful. This is going to happen in the liturgy, and then necessarily we're meant to live the liturgy, so therefore it's going to affect life as well. Key points now to remember as we go, as we go forward. There are things that we know, things that I've at least alluded to to some extent, but let's keep in mind that by the sacramental character of holy orders, so we know that the three sacraments, baptism and confirmation and holy orders, imprint an indelible mark upon the soul. The third of those, the one which most intimately imprints the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ upon the soul, the sacramental character of holy orders, this is important. This is crucial. This is fundamental. In this, this world, this egalitarian and democratic world, this makes that man unique. This makes that man in his very being, in other words, his soul is now, as St. Augustine uses the analogy of a coin being imprinted, and he says that's what happens when the sacramental character goes on to a soul. There's a change in the very being. It's now the imprintation, the, the, imprint, the printing of the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ in various levels, but with the sacramental character of holy orders, he is unique. He is special, he is objectively elevated, and this is a separate human being from everyone else. As, in a different way, the sacrament of baptism does the same thing. It separates entirely those beings, those human souls which are imprinted with that sacramental character. This sacramental character 
then makes this man what we have traditionally termed an altar Christus, another Christ, in a very special way. And he's now been made, this, this, this character is now essential for sacrifice. It's orientated to sacrifice. What we're going to see now, let's just look at this new theology and the liturgy, which attacks sacrifice specifically. Firstly, the ambiguity in the new rite of ordination. The old rite of ordination, very clear. Start to finish, you are being ordained to offer the sacrifice both for the living and for the dead. There's ambiguity now in the, the new rite of ordination. I've already spoke about ecumenism, the rampant false ecumenism. The exigencies of that false ecumenism, they of necessity have to attack sacrifice and priesthood. The doctor showed some of that already, about the need to get rid of those things, even in a radical way, which might be stumbling blocks to the so-called separated brethren, regardless of whether they're revealed or not, regardless of whether it's the will of God or not. We then look at the, especially the, the three principal parts of the Holy Mass, or I could say even before that this, this, this overemphasis on the supper, the supper. No one says that there's not a, St. Thomas alludes to it as the sacrum convivium, the sacred banquet. But that's a sacred sacrum fitre, a sacrificed banquet. We go into that, of course. We look at the three principal parts of the Mass, the offertory, which is also known as the oblation, the consecration, and then the communion. Luther, he speaks of the offertory as an abomination. An abomination because it stinks of sacrifice. And the reformers have to get rid of that for all the various political, social, and religious reasons. The offertory is the dedication of the sacrificial gifts. It's the sacrifice prepared. It's the fixing of the intention of the sacrificing priest and the purpose for which the sacrifice is being made at that time. It enshrines, the traditional mass enshrines the teaching of Trent. Since the Reformation, it's been a bulwark of orthodoxy. What do they do, as the doctor already showed? Eliminated, deleted. What do we have now? We have vague, am ambiguous, ambiguous terms of the, the bread of life, the spiritual drink, the fruits of the labor of our hands, all these terms which can be interpreted in any number of ways, but don't make it very clear that this is a sacrifice, an immaculate host, the chalice of salvation, sancta sacrificia illibata, all these beautiful words in the offertory which do that, replaced by these vague and ambiguous expressions. I want to, just a quote, I'm going to continue on with the, the, the consecration of the communion, but the, which I think it's an important time to insert it here. Archbishop Lefebvre, again, the new mass is not formally heretical, but it indirectly favors heresy because it creates an atmosphere that does not sufficiently uphold the fundamental truths of the holy mass. The rampart of the faith constituted by the liturgy has been destroyed. Why should one be surprised that faith disappears and the people no longer believe in anything and are ignorant of the very rudiments of the faith? This is the logical outcome. It is fatal, says the archbishop. That's especially with that offertory, with an elimination of all these things, an omission of all these things which make sacrifice so prominent in this, these principal parts of the Mass. The consecration, this is obviously the sacrificial, as we know, the sacrificial act proper. It's the very center, the, the summit, it's the holy of holies. Very clear both by the typography in a traditional missile, if you've ever looked at it, not just your missile, maybe even the hand missiles, it's been a long time since I looked at one, but the, the missile itself, it's very clear something different's happening. Boom, now there's space, there's big, there's different, um, uh, different size uh, font, et cetera, 
as well as the rubrics. If you watch, there was the time in the in the video when the, the traditional priest was doing, it's it's a it's a model, it's modeled after the way that our Lord did that very first consecration. What do we have now? We just have the narrative. Basically a narrative. You don't need a sacrificer to do that. You just need a reader, a lector. You just need a minister. Anyone can get up there and just read uh, read a narrative. What happens then is it's not clear anymore that this is a very this is a separate and special sacrificial action. This is a grave thing, and it leads even in, as Cardinal Adiviani mentions, it leads to the potential, the potential um, multiplication of invalid masses because you're not quite sure, a poorly formed priest without the proper intention, without the rubrics making you say, oh, you're doing something different right now. There's some very, very big problems there. Next we have the, the communion, the incessant attack on the real presence, either by gross neglect or simple disrespect, both liturgically and paraliturgically. In the liturgy itself, it just a, it just a, it's just not any different than anything else. When you understand the meticulous care from the time you're trained as a seminarian to say the mass up until even even the preparation, the steps to get to the, the priesthood, the, the meticulous care which the church through her rubrics based upon her theology, that this is the body, the blood, and the soul, and the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And any sensible particle, no matter how small, is the body, and the blood, and the soul, and the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, necessarily, it must be treated thus. And what we have without the genuflections, not the consecrated uh, vessels, the purification, all the different things, even to instruction. I remember when I was in the seminary in, in Minnesota and the archbishop uh, there, uh, Weakland, who was just awful, God rest his soul, speaking in the instruction after one of these masses, you saw in the new mass there, they're preparing all these multiple chalices, that's to pass out. The instruction afterward, how, how do we dispose of the bread and wine after the liturgy? Now, he's not saying there's no, this is why when the Archbishop says it's not formally her heretical, he doesn't say we don't believe in the real presence of Jesus Christ. That's a formal heresy. But to say we're going to put the bread and wine, take the, the wine needs to be disposed carefully down a, whoa, 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 this is what we have. So after 40 years of this indirect and insidious attack upon the real presence, what do we have? What's the result? 10%? I don't even know what the, what the, what the, 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 the numbers are now. 10, 12, 20%, 9%, wherever it might be, of Catholics believe in the real presence. This is an attack because it attacks the sacrifice when there's no victim, well, there's no sacrifice because a sacrifice produces the sacrificial victim, which is then consumed in Holy Communion. The completion of the sacrifice, the sacrificial act brought to completion, as we had those foreshadowings in the Old Testament. The intimate connection between the real presence and the sacrificial nature of the Mass. It's not really Christ, it really wasn't a sacrifice. The real presence is attacked by Protestants, by modernists, by ecumenists. The real presence, the sacrificial nature of the mass. Now we'll look at the, some attacks directly on the, on the uniqueness of the ordained minister, the Catholic priest. What we have, and I've alluded to this already, we have, starting in Vatican II, certainly prepared before like all the craziness that erupted, but a, an exaggerated notion and emphasis upon this common and universal priesthood of the people. We, we're, we want to be intellectually rigorous. We want to know what the truth is. There is a truth to that. Many of you have probably encountered that the Protestants will quote St. Peter's epistle, a priestly nation or uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the people, the priestly people. Well, it's true. Again, the, sa the sacramental characters, three of them, what do they do? It's a participation in the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Therefore, when we're baptized, we now have a certain participation. But St. Thomas makes it very clear in his Tertia Pars, question, I believe, 63 or 83. I couldn't remember offhand. He says that this is now a passive participation. By baptism, and the church has never not emphasized the absolute necessity of this, so much so as we all know by our catechism in, in, in the state of necessity, in a case of emergency, anyone can baptize. You get the nurse in the hospital to baptize the little baby. It doesn't matter what, you don't ask her what religion she is. Please do this. This has to be done. We have to have this, this baptism done. That participation is a passive participation. It is not, as St. Thomas says, the ministerial priesthood, which allows confection of sacraments and distribution of sacraments. It's a different participation, a, a, a seriously different participation. This is going to be enshrined in Lumen Gentium, when the, doc, the, the documents of the, of the council. In the paragraph, the people of God and the universal priesthood. And if you read this, it's just typical modernist writing. You have truths and even some emphasis on the priesthood. And then just like on the Latin, Latin has prime of place and we must use Latin. It's, it's from antiquity. However, for pastoral reasons, if we want to totally destroy Latin, go right ahead and do it. Okay, it wasn't exactly said that way. That's the result, though, of course. And that's what happens here. The placement, where this is placed, it's the universal priesthood is placed first. The context, content is ambiguous, but allows for the interpretation. You can be one of these so-called conservatives who scratches in there and finds it. You could do that. But you have to be honest and admit that the other side could do the same, which is exactly what the doctor showed with the, with the, with the mass there. That the Anglicans can say it, we could say it, everyone can say it. Well, if that's the case, is it really a Catholic mass? So, Lumen Gentium, and what's going to happen after the council? I mean, it's just incredible. You look at look, any of the historical documents, preaching, teaching, writing by these so-called experts, continuously reiterating this universal priesthood, which is, again, is it formally heretical? No, there's truth there. There is a universal priesthood based upon baptism, and it's a participation passively to be able to receive God's grace, to be able to receive it specifically through the sacraments. We're then going to have it enshrined, 1969, the Novus Ordo. You read the Adivyan Intervention, this universal priesthood. 1983, a new, a new code of canon law enshrining this universal priesthood. 1993, a new Catholic catechism doing what? You guessed, enshrining this new universal priesthood an attack upon the uniqueness and the sacramental character which is given and imprinted on the soul in the sacrament of holy orders. Looking a little bit more at the masses, the true mass and the new mass. Indications from the true mass, the priest is acting in persona Christi. Some things which are maybe not even perceptible to many people. Maybe you've never even heard some of these things before. The first one, probably not. There's an admonishment when you're preparing, you're learning how to say the Mass. And the rubricist and the liturgist will say, from the time you wash your hands and put that amice on, the priest is, it should, to the very best of his ability, it's not always possible, you get little boys who are serving Mass, you've got to tell them things. You're meant to no longer speak profane words. You're no longer meant to speak. That's the main reason why the sacristy is silent. It's the antechamber of the sacrifice. It's where the altar Christus assumes Christ. It's not me anymore. That emphasizes to the priest from the beginning. I've always been draconian of that in sacristies. People don't understand. Shh, that's enough. If you don't know, for the, for the, for the boys, if you, you could ask Sam over there taking notes. Wait, if you don't know your role serving before, if I'm vesting and you not need to be tell, telling people what's going on about where, you, where you're moving or something during the mass, get out. You don't belong here now. You should have already been prepared out of respect for the, for the, uh, for the, for the holy mass. That the eyes cast down. It's to avoid human contact. Contact. It's recollection on the part of the priest. Even 
even when the priest in the traditional mass turns and says Dominus Fubiscum, which is an inv which is giving the Lord, receiving the Lord, and inviting the people to pray at a public part of the mass, he's instructed to keep his eyes down. Now you look at the instructions, one of the things we'll get to later on, I won't, might not mention it specifically, but the need for the priest at the Novus order to be engaging. This is a conference, of course, I don't want you sleeping. So I've got to come over here and get some eye contact. I want to make sure people are actually paying attention. This is a time in a conference. We've got to make that act of will now because it's going to go on for another half hour and you've got to, you've got to make that act of will. This is a conference. This is not the Holy Mass. And yet what we saw with some of those examples, many of you who've, who've attended, unfortunately, by the grace of my good mother and father, I never attended the Novus Ordo Mass. They never assisted at the, whole, at, the, at the Novus Ordo Mass. From 70 on, we went to the traditional Mass. I was confirmed, I, was, I, I received my communion in the, in the traditional Mass. I was, I was confirmed by Archbishop Lefebvre in New York in 1976, et cetera, thanks, thanks to them. But you know yourself, this need to be engaging but no, you're, you're, you're Alter Christus. And that's, again, that leads right into the ad orientum. Why is the priest facing the altar? He is the head of the whole mystical body. He's standing in the place of Christ. I always like this. People say, oh, you turn your back to the people. That's idiotic. That's, that's, that's a neck going out to a body. You turn, you do that exorcist thing back from 1972, that movie, you do that head turning thing. That's what's happening. You're taking a head and you're turning it back to the body. That's what's happening in that. You talk, about, <laughs> you talk about a problem. That's the whole mystical body with the priest standing in the place of Christ offering this sacrifice to God the Father. That's the purpose of that orientation of the Holy Mass. We don't have that in the Novus Ordo, obviously. The priest, I'll just give two examples, one a lesser, one a greater example of this difference between the faithful. It was, I think uh, Brian already spoke about it, the, the two confiteors at the beginning of Mass. The priest says a confiteor and the faithful say a confiteor. That makes a difference. Now we have a new penitential rite where you don't have to say it at all, or it's integrated. We're all the people of God being sorry together. Again, formal heresy? No, but again, an indication. And 40 years of that, 50 years of that, are going to bring about an entire different way of thinking. The proliferation of the ministers, which will lead me into my last point on this point as well. Ministers, you, it's, if, if you just looked, you could tell, again, if it's a concelebration with nine people, you're still not quite sure, but someone up there is a little bit above everyone else. But my goodness, someone's proclaiming the gospel, someone's doing readings, people are doing offerings, all things are happening. And I always think it's, a, you know, it's just incredible. You've just, <laughs> In one sense, he's diminished, and then in another sense, it's like King Farouk, you know, kind of just sitting there in your chair, you know, waiting for someone to come up with a palm leaf and to do this. And it's just this, this dichotomy of craziness which is going on. Something is not right. And again, what the doctor said, which is very true, you just take someone. Chesterton always says this. He says it in a number of his, his writings. Uh, I think it's especially, it begins the everlasting man. If you're either in it and you love it, the best other position is to get the heck out of it and to be able to look at it and see what it is. If you could take someone objectively who has no preconceived notions about the faith and said, is this, this example adoration of God and reverence and respect and this one, it, it, it becomes very clear. This leads to, and I think it's, excuse me, um, the two confiteors, I jump to the ministers. I want to go back to the, the greater example of this difference. This is very important, and St. Thomas speaks about this. The, the mass at times, the voice of the priest, out loud and then silently. St. Thomas says, again in his Tertia Pars, when the words of the holy sacrifice are said out loud, these things are for, for both priest and faithful, like the common prayers. However, those things which pertain to the priest alone, like the offertory and the consecration, these are said silently, and only he, the priest, hears them. This is, again, the rubrics of the Mass, the practice of the Mass, the celebration of the Mass, hinged on proper theology, that there is a distinction between the two. Now we have just an out loud Mass. 
because there's no longer a distinction between what's the priest as as part of the people of God through his through his uh, baptism, if you wanted to go to that extreme, or simply the priest as teacher when he's teaching or he's invoking and telling people, inviting people to prayer, all those parts of the mass, and then the parts which are sacrificial, the sacrificial action, which begins from the offertory and goes to the consecration completed in the communion. The, I talk about the proliferation of ministers, and while we're proliferating these ministers, we're eliminating something. What do we eliminate? We eliminate those steps to the priesthood, something very much overlooked, the tonsure ceremony, tonsure. Your hair is cut, the vanity, the beginning of your sacrifice. You're not a man like everyone else. In the old days, it was, you know, a dad, I would go into the barber, I want to cut just like my dad. What is that? That's the one with the hole in the middle. <laughs> the, 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 or the hole right down the hole front. <laughs> the tonsure. The Lord is, you, as the, the, the bishop, as he's cutting your hair, he repeat the, the psalm, the Lord is the part of my inheritance. And then the steps to the priesthood, each one of those four minor orders are steps toward the altar. Protection of the church as the porter, then you have the lector to be able to read, and then you have the exorcist to expel the demons, and then you have the acolyte who brings the lights right up there to the sacrifice, gone. They're no longer steps of preparation to the priesthood, liturgical steps preparing for the priesthood. And then to me, a grave, grave elimination. It's the, the elimination of the subdeacon. That's a major order. And that's really, that's the start of the perpetual sacrifice for the priest. If anyone's been to the ceremony, beautiful. It's where we get, are you gonna take the step? You gonna take the step? This, that's what comes from the liturgy, it comes from the, the ordination of a subdeacon. They all line up, they're admonished by the bishop. The bishop says, now, if you're going to, if you understand what you're doing and you want to be part of this exclusive club, of course, I'm paraphrasing, make the step. And it's impressive as they all step forward. But what happens traditionally, the subdiaconate, perpetual chastity, that's when you vow to be chaste forever in order for your ordination to come so you can be united and married to the Lamb, the Lamb of God. There's that, and that's the negative part of giving up, and then the beautiful burden at that point of taking on the divine office. You're then obliged to say the divine office. That's the, that's the essence of the sacrifice of the priesthood in preparation for being able to offer the Holy Mass. This is all attacked, this gutting, this changing, how I want to finish, I'm not to the conclusion yet, but I now want to, so this is all that's happened. What is the result? What do, what are, what are can we say, what's the, you know, if we could, the, the official teaching understanding of the mass and the priesthood today. So I looked around and I found very, very recent, this uh, from Boston College, in uh, Massachusetts, of course, which is Jesuit, famous Jesuit uh, university on the East Coast. And they did a two-year study, which resulted in a seminar and then a publication of this study, which came out in December of 2018. So this is 2018. This is, this is, this is recent, major study done by a major Catholic university on the priesthood. The seminar, the priesthood and the ministry for the contemporary church. The exact title was to serve the people of God, renewing the conversation on the priesthood and ministry. So this two-year study. Just a, a nota bene at the beginning. As we know, no sane Catholic has ever claimed impeccability on the part of the priests. That's from the first one ordained St. Peter all the way down to poor old Father McMahon standing before you. And there have been grave, as we know, grave violations and misconduct by priests. We've had in history popes who've had illegitimate children. They've made them prelates. No one's saying the priests are impeccable, incapable in that vessel of clay of offending Almighty God. But that in no way no matter how emotional the argument might be put before us, 
That in no way changes the essential revealed doctrine of Almighty God on what a priest is. What we have now is the liturgical and theological revolution now institutionalized. It becomes institutionalized. Abuses, misconduct, etc., it now becomes something institutionalized. This is what the study says. I'm going to go over this for a few minutes. One goal of the seminar, and I think this is indicative of the entire spirit of it, one goal of the seminar was to deepen the theology of the priesthood that began to emerge at the Second Vatican Council. So some new theology is emerging, beginning to emerge, and we're going to continue to develop that. That's the whole question of the immutability of doctrine and how, what is the, a, a true evolution. It's only, we, we, I can't get into that because I don't have the time. In any case, especially the relationship between ordained, and listen to the, it's carefully chosen words. This is a two-year study by very intelligent, I would like to just say men, but men and women and laymen and, and clergy, a whole conglomeration of people contributing to this. The ordained ministry and the priesthood of the faithful. Those words are chosen. They're, they're chosen for a reason. There's an ordained ministry, like all the other ministries, and there's a priesthood of the faithful. That in itself speaks something. It's talking to us. This is a summary of this. This is the, the essential points. And of course, a desire as ever, the new springtime, a desire to breathe fresh air into the theology and practice of the priesthood. We've got to get some fresh air in there. And again, you can always argue, it's true. We always need to become holier. A priest always needs to know his mass more. He needs to become more virtuous. I'd be the first one to claim that. However, the, the priesthood is the priesthood, objectively speaking. What then, they give five ends or necessities. They don't clearly say exactly what they're talking about here, but five ends, essences of the ordained ministry. One, one amongst many. So they're talking here about the priest, and they're going to call him the priest. So the very first and most important one, everybody with just two seconds, three seconds, the first and most important one. We've already said it. We know what it is. The priest as preacher. Number one, the priest must have the capacity to preach the word of God in ways that nurture the faith, the hope, and the love of the disciples of Christ. It's just that typical language. But again, there's, there's truth to that. A priest's sermons and his preaching and his teaching is confident. Hopefully, I pray to God after you've woken up that you will then say, you know, I got something from that conference. He actually inspired me. I got something. I understand something more. Yes, there's a, a greater faith and hope of the disciples of Christ. Pope Francis stresses that, quote, the homily is the touchstone for judging a pastor's closeness and ability to communicate with his people, unquote. And here, indeed, here is the, we're back to the to the to the, uh, the the study. A priest unable to preach well would be a contradiction in terms. You are not a priest. If you can't priest preach well, you are not a priest. Contradiction in terms. We've all been to some humdinger, some boring sermons. <laughs> Dear Lord, we hope at the end, if that were the case, you'd say, I got to get out of here because this is going to be an invalid mass at this point. That's a contradiction <laughs> in terms up there as you wake up from that, that 45 minute sermon. <laughs> we get to the second end, which really is the most important end. But we're going to see this is the absolute, this is the, you know, the, the, the last nail going into the coffin. The priest as leader of worship and prayer. Okay. We're going to get in this part of this document is about the closest we get to some definition of the mass. And I say they can't define it. They don't want to define it. They like the fluidity of, of lack of definitions because then you can never pin them to it. You read St. Pius X and the great encyclical Pascendi on modernism. That's exactly what you do. Float it out there. And then you say, oh, you're denying the priesthood. No, I'm not. Isn't the mass worship? Oh, yeah, it is. Isn't it prayer? Yeah, it is. Well, see, I'm, a, I'm an Orthodox Catholic. The priest as leader of worship and prayer. The priest, according to this wonderful this, this study, 
must have the ability to lead the Christian community in life-enhancing prayer and worship. That could be the yoga guy down at the, at the street down there. You get the same, that same words, come in here. Or if you want to be mixed martial arts, that will be life enhancing for some people. The life enhancing prayer and worship. Now here we get to the, what I consider their definition of the mass. In presiding at the liturgy, priests gather the community through gospel and blessing into a common ritual action. Again, it's important. In presiding at the liturgy, priests gather the community in gospel, I guess that's the mass of the catechumens, and then blessing, I'm assuming that sacrifice, is that consecration? Is that, well, you get, your guess is as good as mine at this point. Bless gospel and blessing into a common ritual action. That now goes back to what the doctor put up there. Let's radically change. Let's ra if it, when the circumstances demand, in other words, when the devil really wants it, let's radically change this thing. Continue. Here, we're gonna give a nod. Here's a nod. You ready? While priests fulfill a unique role in presiding in the liturgy, fruitful participation. There's a, there's a unique role, something there. Dust off those old books and maybe find it. But for fruitful participation in the church's worship for priests, as well as for all the members of the Christian community, it's inseparable from their life of faith, which is entirely subjective. We all know by our Catholic theology, a priest can be a mortal sin and his mass is still valid. But this fruitful participation in this, this liturgy going on, it's inseparable from their life of faith, their relationship with the church, and their manner of engagement with the wider world. Again, where this this because ecumenism starts with the separated brethren, and then goes to the non-Catholics, and then it goes to all human beings. And now, as you see with the whole exaggerated green movement, we're ecumenical with the trees and the bugs and the birds of the air. <laughs> then it goes on that the three other points. I'll go through them just very quickly. The priest as collaborative leader constantly collaborating. The willingness and aptitude of the priest must be to collaborate as a leader among lay ecclesial ministers and the whole people of God. Four, so this is the fourth one, priest is preacher, priest is leader of worship and prayer, priest is collaborative leader, priest as the public representative of the church. He must have the disposition to lead an exemplary life of discipleship within the ecclesial community. Wait, wait, disciple, no, I'm a priest. I, well, it's just, but then beautifully we'll note the last, the alliteration in this, the last point, number five, the priest is practitioner of pastoral charity. He must have a commitment to practice pastoral charity in the service of the gospel. And again, that's, that's, that's beautiful. Sure, we're supposed to be preaching the word of God. We're supposed to be living the gospel, etc. So, we have some truths in there, albeit vaguely stated. We have gross omissions. We have the typical modernist lingo and, and uh, semantics going on. That's, th this is it. This is the Novus Ordo priesthood. Content. They have a couple, Just to, if I could just say these few key points. They emphasize and re-emphasize I've already spoken about this in, true, in terms of the true participation, the priesthood of Christ, this passive participation from baptism. The, the, the study says it's an absolute key, the recovery of the centrality of baptism. So it's one of these, we'll let, the doctor can tell you during these intermissions about the offense on logic of this. We make a statement, we have to recover the centrality of baptism. So we all say, oh my goodness, we've lost the centrality of baptism. 
Somehow the church has lost the idea that baptism is absolutely necessary for salvation. Unless you be born again in the spirit and water, you don't go to heaven. Unless you believe and be baptized, you shall not go to heaven. The words of the incarnate word himself, our Lord Jesus Christ. When did the church lose the centrality of baptism? We need to recover that. Why? Once again, because baptism makes us all priests. And therefore, we've got to emphasize baptism as the sacrament, which once again, in this, this hyper-ecumenical mindset, it's a sacrament that, you know, most people, most Christian, most people kind of go for baptism. But it's especially, it's that hidden time bomb to be able to say we're all priests. We've done this crazy overemphasis of this sacrament called holy orders. Enough of that. And then what we'll do is we'll use these spacious arguments and say, but look at the abuse of the clergy and look at the, these, of course we have to get rid of this priesthood. We've got, we all have to, what? Laymen aren't abusing kids. Huh? Mm -hmm. The Protestant ministers aren't. The Boy Scout leaders, the teachers, the dirty little secret in public schools. Let's not pretend this is a, this is a whole different problem in a whole different conference. This analysis, the study says, will situate itself, this discussion on the church's priesthood, situates itself under the current discipline. And this is a huge time bomb, which they go to speak about a little bit. We know that the people of God, and many of them are crying out for married priests and for women priests. Unfortunately, the current discipline, and we have to, this study, again, it's, it's, to me, it's, it's a lack of virility because either you're for that or you're against it or you're going to be on to take a position. You say, well, let's hide behind the current discipline, which only allows men to be priests. But when the spirit blows, and there's, it's not too far off from that, we can anticipate later on because it will say, the church must ensure that the practice of ministry and programs for formation for this ministry must respond to the movement of the Holy Spirit in different cultural and historical contexts. So there's no objective and perennial truth. The wind will blow some other way, and we know where it's blowing right now. But the current discipline just won't let us talk about this. So we'll just talk about what we can talk about. We'll destroy the priesthood that we have right now and we'll worry about where the where all the ruins and rubble falls afterward so here you have the new priest which is based of course on a new mass what are the results this new priest which we have to put uh, in quotation marks it's not a catholic priesthood we have the as the archbishop said a denaturing of the mass and therefore a denaturing of the priest we have a severe identity crisis. From his uh, great work, Iota Unum, Romano Amario, who's quoted in the doctor's presentation as well, this identity, identity crisis, it comes from the priest having forgotten the true purpose of the priesthood, which is to provide men with the sacred. And now they think of the priestly state as being a state like any other. That is something which one seeks to achieve one's own potential and then one make one's own contribution to the world. What we have in this destruction, I use an example from the, the beautiful book, A Map of Life by Frank Sheed, which you should read if you haven't read that, and the other, other, some of the other Sheed books, Theology and Sanity especially, gives a, a, a good grounding in these, the, the, the Catholic faith. He uses the example of the razor and the doctor already set that context where something, the essence of a thing, it has in it, to know what a thing is, we must know what it's made for. So if you take a razor, and hopefully most of you did, most of the men did this morning at least, and you say, that's a razor, and that does that. And that worked more or less well, depending upon the razor, depending on the steadiness of the hand, depending upon the stubble, et cetera. But it worked. Now, I don't know what that's for. And I said, well, that's sharp. I'm going to cut a tree with that. <laughs> What's going to happen to that razor? What is going to happen to that razor? Same thing that's happened to the mass and the priesthood. We've denatured them. 
use maybe a, a bigger example, which in the United States we'd understand. We know that, and again, I'm not going to get into the socioeconomic, political, e ethical uh, circumstances around this huge capitalistic venture, but at one time there was a large swath of the United States, more or less around the, the Great Lakes, known as the manufacturing or the factory or the steel belt. And all the conditions which allowed that to be, at least on the certain human and economic level, a thriving region. What happens when you take away the reason that that thrived, the reason that Chicago and Milwaukee and Buffalo and Detroit and Cleveland and Cincinnati and Pittsburgh, all these cities became so prosperous? It becomes the Rust Belt. It becomes poverty and crime ridden. It's a gutting of what made the thing. It's a very appropriate American example of what can happen when you take away the reason and the end for the thing. We have then the lack of vocations. Who would want to become a priest? The priest is now a politician. The priest is now a social worker. The priest is now, I love this one, a motivational counselor for a faith community. Oh, man, is that what I gave up all? <laughs> a nice guy who welcomes with a smile and is ever ready to democratically collaborate and collaborate and collaborate and collaborate in the most ugly looking vestments in the history of mankind. <laughs> none of this, none of this needs a sacramental, sacerdotal character. It's been gutted. Why would a young man become a priest? And although it still does happen, the huge exodus of priests, when this whole thing was introduced, and men had more or less decent spiritual lives, more or less decent formation, and all of a sudden you're told, you got to wear those butterfly vestments, and you got to smile at all the people and try to motivate them during every mass. Oh my goodness, we have a, there's a chapel that I say mass in and you're facing the mass and you know, some of our chapels are like that. You have people who they can get really close. So you're saying the canon of the mass and it's like this. I can see this guy, I'm thinking, that's just awful. He's looking at me. I don't, I don't, I don't want to be looked at right now. I just want to do the mass. I couldn't imagine. Hey. <laughs> Why would you become a priest? And why would you remain a priest? What a travesty has happened. Let's conclude. We have a new mass, therefore necessarily a new priest, but this is not a truly Catholic mass, nor obviously a truly Catholic priest. Without the proper notion, understanding, and application of sacrifice, there could be no proper understanding of the mass nor the priesthood. The answer, the answer is quite simple. Return to the truth, the perennial revealed truths enshrined in sacred scripture and sacred tradition, proven by centuries of sanctifying fruits. This would be truly progressive. This would be truly dynamic. This would be truly forward looking because we'd be looking into eternity, into the very mind and will of God. I'll finish with a beautiful quote. I, I started by saying I wouldn't be here uh, without my dear mother and her prayers and example. And just as a side note, when I was born, for whatever reason, she actually prayed to God that I would be her priest. She has three boys. So God bless her. But if I wouldn't be here without her, none of us would be here without Archbishop Lefebvre. And Regardless of any, anything, any dialectic and false accusations, that is the truth. God did not absolutely need him. He could have chosen anyone. But providentially, he's the one that was chosen. I'll finish with this quote appropriately. 
the Archbishop, quote, the Catholic Mass has been, still is, and will forever remain the priestly model, the great pattern of the Christian life. If we modify the Mass, we are going to modify the priestly ideal and the ideal of the Catholic. This is because the Mass is a continuation of the cross of our Lord before anything else. The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ is therefore our means of sanctification. And it is very, it very clearly has to be the reason and the path of sanctification for the priest. The mission of the priest is to offer the holy sacrifice of the mass, the continuation of the sacrifice of the cross, and there he will find the fundamental, the essential, the continual reason for his sanctification, as well as the means of sanctifying the faithful." End quote. Thank you very much. Thank you.